Welcome. This is our first in uh, the new kind of format I'm going to be doing. I'm, I'm going to be doing like um, what I would call like gold nugget pieces instead of reading the entire chapter. I know that, you know, watching uh, videos or, wa or listening to teachings might be a little bit daunting to go through the whole thing at first. So I'm going to be doing it bite-sized portions, okay? In this session, we're going to be talking about Luke chapter 11 verses 1 through 4. That is the Lord's Prayer. They call it the Lord's Prayer. So let's read this, and we're going to go over this. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. When he finished praying in a certain place, now this is talking about Jesus, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now, let me just stop here for a second. I understand that Jesus was Jewish. Really, he was Jewish. He wasn't a white guy. Uh, he, he wasn't even a black guy. He was Jewish, okay? And so uh, it's, as a Jewish, as a Jew, uh, he was a teacher. Uh, he was called rabbi, okay? And this, he was actually a Jewish rabbi. Uh, what a lot of people, I, I think, would well, I think one of the closest resemblances that we can have today uh, to what Jesus was is, you might say, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Orthodox, uh, you know, talking about those who have um, a faith that is kind of like back to the, you know, an ancient kind of faith or back to the uh, the roots of the faith. So Jesus certainly was, you know, he, uh, he lived 2,000 years ago. In the flesh, of course, and we know he's still alive today, but uh, he was a Jewish rabbi. And uh, I understand that every Jewish rabbi, even up to today, but you know, even especially back in those days, they all had disciples. It wasn't an unusual thing for uh, for Jesus to have for Jesus to have disciples because every Jewish rabbi had their own disciples. Okay, it doesn't say anywhere in the in the Gospels. It doesn't say anywhere in the Scriptures that someone said, you know, to him, "Oh Lord, isn't this cool? You've got twelve guys following you around. They're your they're your your disciples." No, they were all used to to rabbis having their own pick of disciples, and that's exactly what Jesus did. As a Jewish rabbi, he chose his own disciples. So. In following tradition, and not only following tradition, but also just common sense, the disciples would ask their rabbi how to pray. Teach us how to pray. It says, Lord, teach us, how, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. So we say, you know, John the Baptist, he taught his disciples to pray. Jesus, we want you to teach us to pray. You're the rabbi. Teach us. How should we pray? So once again, it wasn't a new thing. It wasn't just a new idea. It wasn't like, oh, Lord, show us some kind of new prayer that we can pray. Or so, give us, you know, we got a new idea. Teach us how to pray. Give us the Lord's Prayer. No, it was something that every Jew, Jewish rabbi and their disciples did. Okay? So they come to the point where every Jewish rabbi came to, every one, you know, every disciple of any Jewish rabbi came to the point where they say, teach us to pray. This was common practice, okay? Verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, okay? Again, let me just stop here because we want to, we want to get the most out of all the scripture. We want to, we want to, let's dig in deep. Let's, let's eat the meat here, okay? Jesus did not say, when you pray, think, some people go like this. And you say, what are you doing? Well, I'm praying. How are you praying? Well, I'm thinking thoughts to God. Well, that is not what Jesus said to do here. He said, when you pray, say. There's power in words. You know, the scripture says, your words, your tongue has the power of death or life. You know, you can choose to speak death or you can speak to, choose to speak life, okay? Um, 
So Jesus said, when you pray, say, there is power in your tongue. You need to say, our Father in heaven. Now, again, this is not a new concept. I know a lot of you think that, you know, that the whole concept of God as Father is new. Not necessarily. It came from the so-called Old Testament. You know, Jesus, or excuse me, you know, the Lord said, um, God said in the Old Testament, um, Come out from among them and be separate, and I will be a father to you. Okay? And, and, you know, another place that says, you know, you will be my son. Okay? When God is talking about, you know, Jesus. So, Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. There is power in knowing God. I'm not just talking about just the liturgical part of it, not just saying it. But really, truly knowing God in your heart as Father. Not everyone is a child of God. So God is not Father of every person. Let me explain. I know some of you might be like, what? What did you say? No, listen. Listen, okay? You know, the scripture says, if you don't listen to the whole th- argument in, and you come, with, you come up with an answer before listening, you're foolish, okay? Don't be a fool, Listen, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. And of course, you know, most of you, if not all of you, know the story of Nicodemus where he was like, what are you talking about born again? You know, um, am I supposed to go back in my mother's womb to be born again? And Jesus said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not talking about being born, you know, of the flesh. I'm talking about being born in the spirit, Okay, referring to the spirit, the spirit, the spirit of God. Okay, so being born of the spirit is being born of God. So Jesus said to to Nicodemus, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. I'm telling you, a lot of people, actually, the vast majority of people are not born again, truly born again. I mean, really born again, where they can say the old is completely gone, the new has come. The old life, the old so-called creature is totally gone. The old man is dead, completely dead. And I am risen with Christ, a new creation in Christ. I live life in newness. I live life in righteousness, in holiness, and in, can I say the word? I know a lot of you would cringe at this, but sinlessness, because John said, you read it in, in, the, in, the, in the letter of John, he said, those of you who are born of God cannot sin. That's another whole video all by itself, because a lot of people don't even know what sin is. They think that sin is just making a mistake. Just, you know, anybody who's not perfect in the eyes of men are sinners. That's not what the scripture says. You can live a perfect and blameless life. Paul said he did in Philippians. He says, according to the law of God, according to the Torah, I'm blameless. Perfect. It says in in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 6, that the, the parents of John the Baptist walked blamelessly. Blamelessly. In other words, they didn't do anything wrong. According to all, not some, but all the commandments of the Lord. Okay? So it's possible. You know, God doesn't bark out commands like a tyrant that he knows that other people cannot fulfill. No. He does not, you know, abuse his people like that. No, he doesn't. He tells his people to do things that he knows that can be done. You know? He doesn't demand that they do something that they cannot do. And so, in order to really pray the way Jesus prayed, you must know God as Father. In order to know Him as Father, you must be born again. Born of God. Born of the Spirit. If you're not born of God, then you are not a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, you cannot really truly call Him Father. Certainly, you can just recite the prayer, Our Father. When you're praying, you can say, Father... But really deep inside, you do not really, truly know him as father because you have not been really, truly 
born again. I'm not talking about just going forward, saying a sinner's prayer, accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. So many people do that and have not been born again. I'm one of them, okay? I can tell you of my own testimony. There are many times I got on my knees, I prayed to accept the Lord as, as, as you know, to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then months down the road, okay, I actually got born again and I realized, hey, all those times I came to the Lord in prayer, all those times I accepted Jesus as my Savior, I wasn't truly born again. And I know that makes a lot of your head spin, but that is the truth. That is the truth. You have to be born of God in order to be a child of God. And you cannot truly call God Father unless you are truly His child, you know? It's just common sense. It's just, you know, plain logic here. So, yes, you must pray. When you're truly born again, you can pray, Our Father in heaven. Let me just wrap it up. Let me just, I, I just feel like I have to stay on this topic for just a few more seconds. There's so many people that think that everybody's a child of God. Absolutely not. Okay, Jesus said in John chapter 8 to a whole group of people, you are children of the devil and you do what your devil wants, what, what the devil wants because you, your father is the devil. He even said you speak the language of your father because he's a liar and he's always been a liar from the beginning. Because you are a child of the devil. He said that to a lot of people. Jesus said he's, they're a child of the devil. You cannot be a child of the devil and be a child of God at the same time. <laughs> Obviously. Okay? So, there, most people are not truly children of God. Okay? Wide is the path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are on it. There are many devils and children of, 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 of the devil on that road. But narrow is the path. Straight is the way. Very narrow, very small, very, very hard. You, you, you basically, you got to balance on that. It's like walking a train track. You got to balance on it. The straight and narrow is indeed straight, and it, it is indeed narrow. Okay? And Jesus said, few there be that find it. I guarantee you when Jesus said few, he meant few, okay? And I'm talking about few, even in the light of how many people that actually go to church today. Even the people that go to church, few of them are really, truly born again. Few of them are really, truly born of God. Only few are really, truly the children of God. So he said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, or holy is your name. Okay, again, holy and name. Let's just talk about this for a second. Holy means set apart, not like the rest of the world. Set apart from the rest of the world. Okay, when you're holy, you're not part of the world system. You don't think like the world, walk like the world, talk like the world. You don't look like the world. You are holy. Holy is your name. Ho hallowed be thy name. May your name be kept holy. The name of God is more than just letters and that make up a, a word or a name. It's more than just the liter literal name. When it says name in, in the scriptures, it's talking about what that person, you know, what, what how should I put this? What com comprises a person, okay? What is it that makes that person who that person is? What is it about that person that makes that person who he is? That's the name, okay? Not just letters making up a word that we call a name. No. Not just saying in the name of. No. The name, the when it says, may your name be holy or Holy is your name. Hallowed be your name. It means 
holy, set apart, separated, precious, kept separate is your name, which means everything about you, all of the attributes of God, all of that which makes the personality of God is holy. See, a lot of people say, well, God is love. and well, Everybody says that. The whole world says that. Is that holy? Is that making his name holy? No, because God is love, but it's not love in the human sense because a lot of people confuse love with lust or love with, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, when you, you know, if you accept me, that's love. But if you reject me, that's hate. Well, everybody rejects somebody. Okay. This is the whole love hypocrisy. You know, I find myself, I can tell you my own experience, that I have found more rejection from those who believe in love than anybody else. They are of the worst hypocrites. Hypocrites of the worst kind. So, yes, God is love, but God is a certain kind of love that does not give room to human sin, okay? God's love does not accept sin. It's true. God is love, yes, but God is also a great judge. God is also a consuming fire. If, if you think that it means, when, when it says in the scriptures, when you think that God is love means that God loves everybody in, in that sense, then when it says that God is a consuming fire, you should be going around teaching everybody that God burns everybody alive. You understand what I'm saying? If you apply that, that principle to the love, you need to apply that principle to the consuming fire. When Nadab and Abihu were, dis, were consumed, left but nothing but just two piles of ashes by the fire of God, when they offered, when they offered that, what they call strange uh, fire or strange uh, offerings at, at the temple, it says that fire came up from the presence of the Lord and burned them all to a crisp. There was nothing but just ashes left. Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed. God is a consuming fire, it says. Does that mean he consumes every, everybody right now is just nothing but a pile of ashes? No. You got to take it in context. God's a consuming fire to certain people. God is, a, God is love to certain people. God is judge. It also says God is holy. Absolutely holy. Holy is your name. We just talked about it. So we need to keep his name holy by making sure we don't give in and fall prey to the ways of the world. Cave in to the pressures of the world. We got to make sure we stay strong. Okay? May your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. Your kingdom, again, now this means God's rule over you. He is king. God is king. May your kingdom come. May his rule be established in your life right now. Now, you cannot have a kingdom without a ruler, a ruler of the kingdom, a king, and you cannot have a king who rules without rules. And one of the great things, uh, let me rephrase that, one of the things about the great falling away of the, of the church, as it says in the scriptures, there will come a falling away in the last days, and we're seeing that right before our eyes. One of the things about the falling away is that the, that the church has fallen away from the instructions, the rules, the guidelines, 
the laws, the precepts of God. They say, oh, we don't go by that no more. We go by, it's only by faith, only by grace, only by love. That's not what the scriptures teach. I don't have enough time to get into all that. Re- listen to listen to my all my other teachings. You know, it, it'll bless you. you. Listen to it with an open mind. You know, listen to it, uh, praying that God will show you things that you've never known before. And I guarantee you, He will show you things that you've never known before, if you humble yourself and admit that what you've heard and what you've believed up until this point may have just been a little bit untrue. And it's true because we're fall- we are living right now in the days of the great falling away of the church. I remember a pastor uh, said to me, I, I was meet, I met with a pastor before who said to me, you know, you know, uh, back in the days when a prophet or you know a man of God came into town, everybody would repent before they went to the meeting. Because if they didn't repent of their sin before they went to the meeting, they knew. They just knew that God would show the preacher their sin and they would be called out for their sin. Supernatural knowledge of God. Hey, there's a man here. Your name is John and you're, 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 you're a thief. Hey, there's another man here. Your name is Mark and you're living in adultery. You need to, you need to uh, repent. So they would repent before they, before they even went to the meeting. They wouldn't dare go to the meeting without repenting or else they'd be called out for their sin. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter, I believe it's 12, where it says that, you know, when someone is a prophet among you and, and an unbeliever comes before you, you, will, you will, they will fall down on their knees. They'll worship and say, God, truly God is among you. They will repent because they will be judged of all, it says in Corinthians. It's either uh, 1 Corinthians 12 or 14. They will be con- convicted or convinced. Con- convicted means convic- convinced of your sin and judged of all. I know some people say, well, God is judged. Let God be judged. That's not what God said you will be the judge. You will judge the world. You will judge the angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And in other scriptures as well. We're going to get to that. Actually, that's there's a lot in the scriptures that talk about that. Stick with me and you'll learn a lot. May your kingdom come. Let your rules be my way of life. Let your rule be my way of life. Not what I think, not what I imagine God to be, not what I imagine Jesus to be, this tree-hugging hippie. No. The real, true Jesus. The Jesus that called a woman a dog, that that said that she's a dog because she's not a Jew, that refused initially to give her a a miracle. You know, uh, that called Herod a fox, that constantly called lots of people hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, uh, brood of vipers, brood of snakes, sons of hell, sons of Satan, on and on the list go. The list goes on and on. Why else do you think that these people said, crucify him when the time came? May your, ki- may your kingdom come. Rule and reign in our life. May your rules, may your guidelines, may your laws be our lifestyle. By the way, it's eternal. The word of God from the beginning to the end is eternal. God never makes a mistake. Therefore, he never needs to change. The covenant changed, but not the law. You need to understand the difference. And again, there's another video about that as well. But just to quickly wrap it up, law is not covenant. Covenant is God's it, it, it involves the law, but it's separate from the law. That's why we got two different words, covenant and law, okay? Torah and bris, okay? It's two different things, two different things. Right, I'm talking a little bit of Hebrew words here. But um, yeah, so the old covenant is God's law written on stone. It's very clear. That's what, that's what it is. In, in, uh, uh, Paul says that in his letters. Jeremiah says that in his letter. Whereas the new covenant is God's 
law, the same law, the same eternal word of God written on your heart. How do you know that you have the real, true New Testament faith? Well, because it lines up with the Old Testament faith. Hello? Acts chapter 17, when Paul came to preach the gospel to the men of Berea, it says they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said, if it lined up with what Paul said, or if, excuse me, if, Paul, if what Paul said lined up with the scriptures. What scriptures did they have back then? Nothing of the New Testament, I tell you. It was all Old Testament. The first century church, what did they preach from? What was their text? What was their Bible? It was not the New Testament. Getting off here on a rabbit trail, but I felt like I needed to say, to say that. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a wonderful thing to say. We need the will of God to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What's it like in heaven? There's no sin. It's according to the word of God, the will of God, completely. There's no sexual immorality. There's no inordinate lust. There's no, there's, there are no thieves. There are no greedy people. There are no selfish people there. They're all holy, living righteously. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing but blessings. Give us day by day our daily bread. Or give us this day our daily bread. This is acknowledging God as your source. Okay? It's not your job. It's not the government. It's God. God can use your job. God can use the government. God can use anything and anybody that he wants. He even used a fish in Jesus' day to help pay the tax. Okay? Okay? Give us this day our daily bread. This is acknowledging and honoring and respecting God as your source. Your source of all life and all material needs. Verse 4. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Whoa! Wow, there's a lot of people need to... Read that and practice that, as it says in the old uh, scriptures, the old version. Forgive us our debts as we forget, uh, as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It all means the same thing. Forgive us as we have forgiven others. Jesus said very plainly in in um, in other in the other gospel that we we just read. If we don't forgive. God won't forgive us. And let me tell you, my dear friend, you will not darken the door of heaven with sin, unforgiven sin in your life. You need to have that sin forgiven. You need to repent of it. You need to have it forgiven. You're not going to see heaven without it. You're not going to see heaven, I mean, without sin, uh, without, uh, without forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. That's very important. You need, in order for God to hear your prayer, don't expect Him. He might, but don't expect Him to hear your prayer, hear and answer your prayer if you got sin in your life. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And let, let me just add, it's important to go through your sins. Uh, it's important to go through your bitterness, uh, your unforgive, your unforgiveness with God. What you need to do, put this on your list for tonight. Do it tonight. What you need to do is get on your knees or on your face before God and say, Father, show me everybody that I need to forgive. Everybody. Start with, fa with your own father and your own mother. Start with your own dad and your own mom. I know that hits a nerve for a lot of you, but you, that's what you need to do. Well, you don't know how bad of a person he was. Well, Jesus said, forgive. And that, that, again, that doesn't mean that you make yourself a doormat for any of these people. I mean, if, 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 uh, if a man is, um, 
you know, a murderer and he just kills everybody in sight, then it doesn't mean to forgive him doesn't mean you just go up to him and say, I forgive you and stand right in front of him when he's got a gun in his hand. No, you don't do that. Forgiveness is one thing. Getting trust and earning trust back is another thing, okay? Forgiveness just means that you're not holding that against him, but there needs to be trust that is, you know, uh, earned uh, after the fact, okay? So you need to forgive. And uh, if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. And if he doesn't forgive you, if he's angry with you, how do you expect him to listen to your prayer and answer it? So you need to ask God, Father, um, show me everybody that's ever sinned against me, everybody that has ever sinned against me, or everybody that I've that I have that I'm holding anything against. Maybe that person has sinned against a pers- uh, another person, another individual, or another group of person. Maybe not you directly, but but you hold that against that person. Oh well, Johnny, he he killed Mark. I I I am bitter because I love Mark and he killed him. Well, Johnny. You know, he sexually abused, uh, you know, Lucy. Well, you know, I mean, that's good reasons to have, you know, things against these people. Uh, you can forgive them um, as, as evil as, as it is. You need to realize that in God's sight, there might have been some sin in your life, actually. It probably is sin in your life that is just as bad as one of those horrible sins, those unforgivable sins that some people might think is unforgivable. You you want to forgive John for for killing Mark. That's one thing. But does that mean now you can go hang around with John saying, I forgive you? No, if if he's still a murderer, don't. All right, it's not, that doesn't mean, forgiveness doesn't mean that you just act like it never happened. It just means that you acknowledge that it did happen, but you're not holding that grudge against him. You are you you have released him from that grudge, but you are still not stupid enough to put yourself in harm's way or your children's uh, in, in harm in harm's way either. Okay, same if if John sexually abused Lucy, you know, uh, you can forgive him. Does that mean that you want to let your daughter hang around with John? Absolutely not, <laughs> unless there's pure, clean, and unrefutable evidence that he has repented, and he is a completely new person, a completely different person, which is possible, by the way. So yes, forgiveness is one thing. Um, putting yourself in harm's way is another thing, okay? So don't don't confuse the two. We need to forgive. We need to let go of grudges. We don't need to be embittered against somebody. We need to... We need to Be warm toward these people as much as possible. When you pray, Father or God, you know, show me these people that I need to forgive, He's going to show you. His names are going to come to your mind, or faces are going to come to your to your to your mind. And you and you what you need to say is, I forgive John for stealing two hundred dollars from me. You need to say, I forgive Mark for destroying my bicycle, (laughs) whatever the case is. Be specific with God. Work through the list. Work through every face and every name that God brings to your mind. I'm serious. You need to do this tonight. Put it on your to-do list. You know, make time tonight to get on your knees or get on your face before God and ask God to show you of people that you need to forgive. And I guarantee after you've worked through everything and you feel like you've totally flushed out all that unforgiveness and you've worked through every person and every name and every every everybody that God brings to your mind, I guarantee you, you will find blessing and freedom and God's presence and God's blessing like you've never known before. It's like you'll say to God, Father, and he'll be right there to listen to you. As 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 the scriptures say, you will call upon me and I will answer you. Last here, it says, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, so again, you are acknowledging that God is on the throne and that everything that happens has to happen 
through God one way or another. Okay? Either he... Either it's... Like, for example, let's say you're walking down the street and a tree fell, fell on your head or something like that. I mean, God... It's either God doesn't love you <laughs> or there's a reason for that. Or, you know, for some reason things have happened in your life. Maybe it's your own fault. Maybe it's your own sin. Maybe it's somebody else's sin. But God is in control of it all. Maybe he's testing you. Okay? That's why it says, bring us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Temptation means testing. Okay? So you're praying that God does not lead you into a time of testing. When you pray that, you are acknowledging that God is in control of, of everything. And that testing or temptation cannot come without God's, without it getting by God first, you know. But deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Uh, many people would would say that this the evil one is uh, Satan or the devil or, you know. Um, it could mean uh, it's just any evil one uh, in your life, but spe- you know, especially the evil one, which is, uh, you know, obviously the devil. Deliver us from the evil one. So you're acknowledging that God has the power and the ability to deliver you from the evil one. And you're calling on him to do so. So you're honoring him and you're asking him. One person said, why do you have to ask God if God already knows what you need? Well, because asking is a form of honoring, acknowledging. God. Sometimes God wants you to acknowledge his power, acknowledge his position in the universe, acknowledge and honor that he's on the throne. That's why a lot of times you have to ask. Because he wants you to acknowledge that. He wants you to pay that homage to him. So there you go. There's the, what they call the Lord's Prayer. Now, is it really the Lord's Prayer? Actually, you know, John chapter 17, when Jesus himself was praying, you know, for him, well, not really praying for himself, really, but it was his prayer. You can say that was the Lord's Prayer. But this is what they call the Lord's Prayer because this is what, how the Lord taught us to pray. So, yeah, this is a very, very good guideline to go by. And I've covered a lot in, in this teaching. So, hey, you know, listen to it again. Um, think about this very, very, very carefully. There's a lot of good truth. A lot of what I, like I said in the be- very beginning, it's a lot of good nuggets of gold here you can, you can, you can mine, okay? You can, you can harvest you can harvest this gold, the spiritual gold. So as you go, may God enlighten your eyes and uh, give you understanding and knowledge above all your peers and bless you, protect you, guide you, and set his angels in his presence to be right there beside you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you.